10 December 1944, after a summer of brilliant victories, three factors combined to make any advance by the Western Allies beyond the German frontier problematic. First, the benefits of capturing the port of Antwerp have only just started to trickle through to the front. Thus, the majority of supply trains still originate from the distant beaches of Normandy. Next, heavier than normal autumn rains hamper the mobility that has to now mark the Allies' advance. Finally, with their homeland literally at their backs, German defenders are fighting with renewed determination. Nevertheless, the Allies do make gains. In the south, General George Patton's Third Army takes the fortress city of Metz and bellies up to the Siegfried Line near the German city of Saarbrücken. In Metz, the mopping up operation still involves clearing the labyrinth of tunnels and corridors beneath the city's forts. Soldiers of Major General John Milliken's Third Corps press forward, capturing the city's center and moving on to its western fortifications, where some German units still hold out. Meanwhile, to the northeast, the 4th Armored Division leads the American charge into the Saar Basin. On 2 December, the 95th Infantry Division captures a bridge over the Saar and proceeds to secure the area by destroying some 50 West Wall pillboxes. While the 3rd Army draws up to the German frontier, the U.S. 7th and French 6th Armies complete General Eisenhower's broad front strategy. This is done by attacks in southeastern France that enables Eisenhower's armies to share in a somewhat straight and contiguous front. For the French, this time proves to be especially satisfying. Nearly four and a half years after the Wehrmacht steamrolled them into capitulation, a French army is fighting its way to the Rhine. Symbolism notwithstanding, this achievement nearly completes the total expulsion of German forces from French soil. By 15 December, the Western Allies are slowing down. Although no geographical obstacle has stopped them for long, the laws of logistics are inviolable. The broad front strategy is proving to be an insatiable giant, consuming supplies at an unbelievable rate, six to 700 tons per division per day, by Ike's own estimate. Additionally, the battle-weary French, Tommies and GIs need rest and refitting. Yes, the vice squeezing the life out of the Nazis has stopped, but only momentarily. Soon these dog faces resting safely in the quiet Ardennes will press on to finish the job. But for right now, it's time to enjoy the scenery. Time to relax and bask in the gratitude of the newly liberated Belgian people. 16 December 1944, Belgium. American soldiers resting in the wintry calm of the Ardennes are abruptly awakened this morning by mortars, rockets, and artillery fire. Thousands of pinpoints of light illuminate the splintering trees and heaving ground as the stunned GIs hunker down in their foxholes. None of these dog faces believed the Nazis could or would mount an assault of such fury here at the end of the war. Along an 85-mile front from Echternach in the south to Monschau in the north, the roar of German tank engines and the scream of artillery echo through the bitter cold of the forest. In many cases, soldiers find themselves alone and isolated as the shadowy forms of German infantrymen thrash by them on their way west. But this offensive is the brainchild of Adolf Hitler himself, who cannot conceive of an Allied victory over his army of Aryan supermen. Formulated shortly after the failed attempt on his life in July, the Führer's plan hinged on launching the attack in early December, when the foul weather would ground British and American planes and nullify Allied air supremacy. The main objective of the Führer's surprise offensive is Antwerp, and he has devised a precise timetable for its capture. If the Wehrmacht can retake the crucial port city, they will drive a wedge between the Americans in the south and the British in the north. Though his generals felt that the plan was madness, the Führer's will won the day. The bewildered generals retreated from Hitler's fantasy world to the real world, 
where they have tried to make something of his plan. Field Marshals Gert von Rundstedt and Wilhelm Mödel were assigned the task of implementing the offensive. Under the strictest of secrecy, they assembled all available German reserves into a formidable fighting force of more than 200,000 men. General Zapp Dietrich, or staunch old Dietrich, as Hitler calls him, leads his 6th SS Panzer Army in the northern flank of the assault. The diminutive General Hasso von Manteuffel commands the 5th Panzer Army, attacking in the center along the same routes covered in 1940. In the south, General Erich Brandenburger's 7th Army protects Manteuffel's flank as they race for the Meuse. The German troops drive headlong into battle with Rundstedt's last exhortation echoing in their ears. We gamble everything. Allied intelligence is just as confused by the assault as the GIs in the foxholes. Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, or Schaaf, had thought the Germans were beaten and that they would spend the winter stalling for time. Time to rebuild the armies shattered by the Allies in the fall campaigns. Schaaf assumed the Germans would try to make their last stand in the spring amongst the deadly entanglements of the West Wall. As the American lines crumble, Eisenhower, sporting a newly conferred fifth star and fresh from his orderly's wedding, meets with General Omar Bradley in Versailles to discuss the implications of the attack. Bradley suggests it might be a spoiling attack designed to weaken American morale by ruining their Christmas. The men in the lines had, after all, come to believe the war would be over by then. The Supreme Commander fears it is more. He has a gut feeling that something big is up. He immediately orders the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions into the line, hoping they will stem the tide of the offensive by bringing relief to the besieged units in the forest. This is of little comfort to the men of Major General Walter E. Lauer's 99th Infantry Division, recently arrived from the States. These green men find themselves facing the brunt of Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army. In the cold, isolated village of Lanserat, a small and badly outnumbered company of GIs from the 99th holds off repeated vicious Nazi assaults. The bone-weary foot soldiers watch in horror as their tank support flees to the rear. One GI notes Riley, they might at least wave goodbye. The main body of the 99th fighting along Elsenborn Ridge gets unexpected help when the 2nd Infantry Division retreats through their lines. The unit had been conducting an attack to the north when 5th Corps Commander General Leonard T. Jero, surprised by the offensive, pulled them back to help the 99th at Elsenborn. In a daring series of fighting withdrawals, the veteran infantrymen of the 2nd assumed defensive positions alongside the 99th. Once his unit is in position, the commander of the 2nd, Major General Walter Robertson, assumes command of both units. With the furs of the Ilsenborn for cover and with liberal artillery support, the soldiers manage to dig in. Now, they wait to see what fate and the Führer have in store. Another inexperienced unit that has just set foot on the continent is Major General Allen W. Jones, 106th Infantry Division. Receiving a bloody baptism of artillery fire from the 12th Volksgrenadier Division, the terror-stricken unit becomes confused and disorganized in the fog. Stationed farthest east of any Allied unit amidst the pines of the Schnee Eiffel, the Hardlock 106th receives contradictory orders throughout 17 and 18 December. Men, trudging back and forth through the dark forests again and again, find themselves fighting pitched battles with small German units. The 7th Armored Division, hurrying to aid the 106th in their defense of the strategic village of Saint-Vite, is delayed and disrupted by American troops fleeing to the rear. The tankers finally reach the contested village but they are too late. In the biggest mass surrender of Americans since Bataan, almost 9,000 men of the 106th have been surrounded by the Germans and marched into captivity. Hardest hit of all are the men of Major General Norman Cota's 28th Infantry Division, 
who already were known as the Bloody Bucket Division because of the grievous casualties they took in the grim battle for the Hurtgen Forest. Panicked soldiers flee to the rear in short order. Commanders watch in horror as whole units are wiped out or put to rout. Unbeknownst to the officers, small pockets of GIs remain at the front and buy time for their retreating brothers by fighting valiantly from positions in the rubble of houses and hotels in small towns like Clairvaux and Vilts. As evening descends upon the Ardennes on 20 December, German soldiers have made massive gains in what appears to be a great victory. But their commanders are careful not to take too much satisfaction in their work just yet. Manteuffel in particular realizes pockets of American resistance have disrupted the timetable so crucial to the Führer's plans. Unless these men can be eliminated, the whole offensive is in danger of failure. Among his concerns is the inevitable reaction of the Allies to atrocities committed by the SS during the fighting. More than 90 civilians have been gunned down in the tiny village of Stavlo by troops of the 1st SS Division. To make matters worse, there are reports of American prisoners of war being executed near Malmedy. Within hours, word is spread through the German and American commands that stormtroopers have summarily executed 86 of 125 GIs who surrendered in the tiny Belgian village. All along the front, German soldiers pick through the spoils of war, finding time for a smoke or a chocolate bar. But as the weather grows harsher, snow and fog settle over the forest, American soldiers find their hearts filling with unspeakable anger. In their foxholes, cold, exhausted, and bitter with the desire for revenge, the GIs sit. They know now there will be no peace by Christmas. With thoughts of home filling their hearts, they know now they must fight on this foreign ground for yet a few more weeks. Perhaps next Christmas. Nineteen December, 1944, Belgium. Along a crumbling front in the Belgian Ardennes, U.S. soldiers are engaged in desperate combat against their suddenly resurgent German foes. Nazi panzer grenadiers, flush with victory, have advanced out of the snow, attacking and overpowering unprepared and disorganized American units. U.S. commanders, lost in the fog of unexpected battle, have ordered retreats on a massive scale as the Germans press forward, creating a bulge in the Allied lines. But small pockets of stubborn U.S. resistance have cost the German juggernaut precious time. In Europe and back home, Newspapers already have coined the phrase Battle of the Bulge. As news of the German victories and German atrocities grows, Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower attempts to regain control over the situation. He splits General Omar Bradley's 12th Army Group. General George S. Patton's 3rd Army in the South will remain directly under Bradley's control. In the north, Lieutenant General Courtney H. Hodges' 1st Army and Lieutenant General William H. Simpson's 9th Army are given to none other than milquetoast British commander, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. The command change has an immediate payoff as Montgomery commits the British 30 Corps to back up U.S. tank units deployed along the Meuse River. Should the Germans attempt to breach the river, they will be in for a tough fight. On the other hand, Montgomery's cautious approach and the inept manner in which he deals with his subordinates immediately irritates the Americans whom he commands. The American sensibilities are rankled by Monty's absolute conviction that his arrival in command will save the day. For the moment, Eisenhower has more important problems to deal with. Through a fluke, one of the many that will affect the outcome of this battle, Eisenhower's reserve unit, the 101st Airborne Division, accidentally finds itself alone and cut off in the strategic hamlet of Bastogne. To make matters worse, the 101st's commander and executive commander are on leave. It will fall to the division's artillery commander, Brigadier General Anthony C. McAuliffe, to lead the division into battle against a force three times its size. 
Bastogne is like the hub of a wheel, where six important roads intersect like spokes, and German units are closing in from all sides. McAuliffe decides to make a stand. His men, a hodgepodge of units, including some elements of the 10th Armored Division, have made the 100-mile journey from Mourmelon le Grand, France, in open trucks. Nevertheless, he sends them immediately into the dark woods surrounding Bastogne. Reports reach McAuliffe of grisly clashes at Noville, Magre, and Marvie. German panzer tanks are pressing forward with deadly malice. Like tigers in the snow, they hunt the paratroopers, intent on devouring them. With each passing hour, it is clearer that the situation is desperate for the Americans. Still, all attempts by German forces to enter Bastogne itself are repulsed by the veteran GIs. On 20 December, the embattled Americans are completely encircled and vastly outnumbered by German forces. As the battle to take the town escalates, supplies run low for the 101st, and the weather continues to worsen. Allied planes, still grounded by heavy fog, can do nothing to bring relief to Bastogne. Casualties mount. Clerks, cooks, and service troops find themselves pressed into frontline service. As one of McAuliffe's aides puts it, the 101st is the hole in the donut. Still, the Americans in the besieged city refuse to give up, and even as they struggle for survival, a plan is hatched at General Eisenhower's headquarters. General Patton tells Eisenhower he will drive to Bastogne and relieve the 101st. Many on Ike's staff scoff at the idea that Patton can halt his Third Army in the midst of a major winter offensive, swing north, then resupply without rest and, in frigid weather, march to the relief of the encircled defenders. Patton knows the situation in Bastogne is desperate, and he knows his soldiers will come through. Before attending the meeting with Ike, Patton already has ordered his staff to implement the plan. On 22 December, Patton's terrible swift sword swings northward toward Bastogne and the relief of McAuliffe. It will be days before Patton can reach the paratroopers, if he can reach them at all. But with defeat seemingly inevitable, the battered bastards of Bastogne awaken on 23 December to the drone of C-47 engines. The weather is cleared, and supplies rain down on the trapped men like manna from heaven. P-47 Thunderbolt fighters hammer at German positions. Like sheep, the unprotected tanks and vehicles of the Panzer divisions are lined up for the slaughter on the open roads leading into Bastogne. Fortified and resupplied, the Yanks in the encircled city suddenly find new hope. The Nazi forces continue to advance with Teutonic tenacity, but the boys in Bastogne fight back stubbornly. Both sides are aware that Patton's army will break through soon. The now panicked Germans send wave after wave of grenadiers in white snow gear against the dug-in paratroopers. On Christmas Day, the Nazis try one last major assault. When the American paratroopers begin falling back, Beierlein believes his victory is at hand. Patton will come too late. But the retreat of the 101st is a clever ruse by McAuliffe. The crafty Yanks have lured the Germans into a trap. As the Panzer Lair troops and tanks pursue the fleeing paratroopers, U.S. tank destroyers burst forward from their hiding places in the woods and blast the stunned attackers. Their assault capabilities spent, the Germans change tactics. They send an ultimatum demanding surrender of the town. McAuliffe replies simply, nuts. Enraged, the Germans loose a hellish barrage of artillery on Bastogne. Shells of all types rain down upon the exposed city, setting fires, leveling houses, and killing scores of American soldiers and Belgian civilians. Still, the paratroopers grimly hold on. Upon hearing the news of McAuliffe's reply, Patton redoubles his efforts to relieve the city. Drive like hell, he orders his men. While the men of the 101st pass an uneasy Christmas, Patton's 4th Armored Division pushes forward in bitter conditions. On 26 December, their lead tanks blast through a lone pillbox near the town of Asenois. Relief has come at last to Bastogne. In short order, McAuliffe radios, we're in fine shape. We're ready to take the offensive. The jubilation is short-lived. 
While Patton's men inflict heavy losses on the Germans in short order, the surviving Nazi units still have plenty of fight left. At Allied headquarters, it is becoming evident that while the battle is far from over, it is not lost. With the victory at Bastogne and the efforts of American units in the northern and southern flanks, the tide of Hitler's offensive is turning. At Nazi headquarters, too, it is becoming apparent that the offensive is in trouble. Bastogne has become an abscess in their lines and its very name rings bitter in their ears. Six January, 1945, Belgium. As the Battle of the Bulge wears on and the Allies struggle to regain control of the war, Adolf Hitler continues to demonstrate that, although he is mad, he is too clever to be written off yet. Throughout the European theater of operations, American soldiers are on the alert for Germans disguised as GIs. They are forced to take strong and sometimes elaborate measures to foil attempts at penetration of their lines. Der Führer, Attempting to gain a psychological advantage over his enemies has ordered the creation of a special commando unit led by SS Lieutenant Colonel Otto Skorzeny. Skorzeny has been tagged by the Allies as the most dangerous man in Europe because of his daring rescue of Benito Mussolini from a mountaintop in Italy. Skorzeny's special Panzer Brigade, dressed in captured American uniforms and equipped with American tanks and vehicles, is under orders to penetrate the Allied lines and seize strategic bridges along the Meuse River. Unfortunately for Skorzeny, his brigade is bedeviled from the outset. While his troops may speak English, many have not mastered American slang and they have trouble passing. Worse, their captured American equipment is in poor shape. Unable to accomplish even the first phase of his mission, Skorzeny wisely gives up and commits the bulk of his 2,000-man unit to the support of the 1st SS Panzer Division. Not so his four-man jeep teams. Thirty of these teams set out to infiltrate and wreak havoc behind U.S. lines. Armed principally with daring and guile, nine managed to obtain their objectives of switching signs, blocking roads, and causing the diversion of American units. One group, when captured, causes even greater disruption to American military operations by confessing a fantastic and completely fabricated plot to assassinate Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower. Eisenhower suddenly finds himself a virtual prisoner in his own headquarters. His security forces take extreme measures to protect him from the non-existent danger. At the front, Crafty GIs alerted to the presence of the German infiltrators devise their own ingenious security procedures. They quiz suspicious GIs on aspects of life at home only a true American would know about. Where is Lil Abner's hometown? Who won the pennant this year? Even General Omar Bradley comes under scrutiny. The 12th Army Group commander is repeatedly halted by zealous MPs. Ultimately, most of the Nazi commando teams are run to ground. They receive proper, if quick, trials, and most are shortly executed as spies. In the northern salient of the bulge, the fight takes on grim overtones around the village of Saint-Vite. The 7th Armored Division, still without winter gear, fights desperately to hold the strategic town. Despite their efforts, the Germans slowly gain the upper hand. Finally, after the battle has deteriorated to the terror of house-to-house -house and sometimes hand-to-hand -hand combat, the 7th Commanding General, Robert Hasbrook, is ordered to withdraw. But even retreat proves difficult as the division's tanks become mired in the muddy roads leading out of town. After an anxious day, Mother Nature takes the GI's part. Plummeting temperatures freeze and harden the muck enough for the armored Frigidaires to escape. In a flurry of automatic weapons fire and supported by tanks of their own, German soldiers charge into the village behind the fleeing Americans. Even in retreat, the dog faces make the Nazis pay for their victory. Valiant rearguard troops in armored cars manage to destroy several Tiger tanks, even with the German infantry snapping at their heels. In the dark woods around Dambutkenbach and Monschau, Brigadier General Clift Andrus 1st Infantry Division hunts down and dispatches a group of holdouts from an elite German paratroop unit, which had surrendered on 23 December after a botched assault on the village of Malmedy. 
Having recovered from the initial shock of the German offensive, the Americans slowly regroup. At the hamlet of Barak de Freitier, the 3rd Armored Division and the 82nd Airborne Division meet the 2nd SS Panzer Division in bloody toe-to-toe -to -toe combat. The fanatical Germans attack the 82nd again and again along a difficult-to-defend 15-mile front. General James Gavin's calls for support are at last answered by the 7th Armored Division, fresh from the Battle at saint vite and by the 9th Armored Division. Still, the battle rages until Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, who has been given command of the American troops in the north by Ike, personally orders a withdrawal to tidy up the battlefield. Gavin is loath to pull his men back, so he orders a fighting retreat. Soon, however, the men of Gavin's command are again on the offensive. Within days, the Americans have consolidated the front line and are able to send troops to help contain the German push to the south. The bitterest fighting centers on the castle itself, only a few miles from the Meuse River. Major General Ernest Harmon, commanding general of the 2nd Armored Division, has marched his unit more than 70 miles from the Aachen area to help stem the German advance. Within minutes of receiving reports that the 2nd Panzer Division is pressing forward, he asks for and receives permission to attack. The Americans rout their enemy in short order. As its fuel supplies begin to run out, the Panzer Division is unable to use its tanks effectively. The Americans watch jubilantly as the Germans abandon their armor and begin retreating on foot. In the south, General George S. Patton's Third Army, fresh from its triumph at Bastogne, pushes resolutely northward. After fighting bitterly for the woods above Bastogne, Patton's men are able to link up with the First Army near Ufalis on 16 January. Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt, having consulted with his senior staff, asks Hitler for permission to withdraw from the Bastogne area. Der Führer, at first, angrily refuses. Hitler already has accepted that his Wehrmacht will not be able to reach Antwerp. Perhaps thinking of a negotiated peace with the Allies, he advises his generals, above all, we must have Bastogne. But as he learns that the American 6th Armored 26th Infantry and 87th Infantry Divisions are pressing westward to bolster American defenses in that city, he is forced to accept that it, too, has slipped from his grasp. With casualties mounting to horrific levels, the bully of the beer halls is forced to accept grim reality. Hitler decides his all-or-nothing offensive is over and turns his attention to the Russian front. Leaving his hapless generals in the Ardennes with no chance for triumph, he packs up his forward headquarters and, on 17 January, journeys back to Berlin, a bitter and broken man. Twenty-three January, 1945, Belgium. Revenge-minded Joes of the 7th Armored Division today launch a smashing frontal assault against the town of saint vit The unit was driven out of the town two weeks ago when the Nazis mounted their last-ditch offensive in the Ardennes. Now, as the pendulum of war swings back in favor of the Allies, they are taking it back from SS General Josef Sepp Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army. Supported by elements of the 30th Infantry Division, the tankers roll into the town after a devastating artillery barrage. From the rubble, the remaining Germans offer a desperate counterattack. They fight like cornered beasts, inflicting heavy casualties upon the Americans. But unlike last month, the U.S. Army is the juggernaut now, and within hours, every last Nazi soldier in saint vit is either dead or marched into captivity. Meanwhile, in a frantic fight for the villages of La Glaise and Monheim, SS Colonel Joachim Piper's 1st SS Panzer Division has its first encounter with the U.S. 30th Infantry Division, known as Roosevelt's SS, for the ruthless manner in which it fights. All too soon, the arrogant Piper learns that the reputation is well-deserved. The Americans inflict grievous casualties upon his unit. Piper watches helplessly as his supplies of fuel and ordnance expire at the height of the battle. Abandoning its heavy Tiger tanks and other equipment, Kampfgruppe Piper flees back to Germany on foot. 
In the south, the ever successful General George Patton commits his 5th Infantry Division to the fray, making a surprise crossing of the Sur River toward the town of Diekirch, Luxembourg. With their flank protected by the 4th Infantry Division, the veteran 5th soon begins pushing the enemy back. Again, the Germans, unable to get fuel and artillery rounds, cannot mount an effective defense against the steamrollering Americans. As the Americans re-establish their forward lines, nine divisions of General Hasse von Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army near Baston and four divisions of General Erich Brandenburger's 7th Army in the south are forced to fall back towards the German frontier. Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army is pulled from the front and sent east to stem the Russian advance. As dawn approaches on 28 January, Allied officials declare the Battle of the Bulge to be officially over. Not so the Battle of the Generals. The ever sanctimonious British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery proudly steps up to press microphones and declares that he has saved the proverbial American skin in the Ardennes. American generals, noting that he had never actually committed more than one British brigade to the fracas, are outraged. To make matters worse, Monty reiterates his suggestion that he be placed in command of all ground forces in the European theater. Montgomery has gone too far, Ike declares. It is time for one of them to go. Montgomery's chief of staff, catching wind of the situation, convinces his boss to retract the request, as clearly America is now the force behind the Allied war effort. A pouting and petulant Montgomery insists he meant no harm. Ultimately, it falls to no less a personage than Winston Churchill to smooth over the Americans' ruffled feathers. Outraged at Montgomery's stupidity, he declares from the floor of the House of Commons that the Battle of the Bulge is an American victory, destined to live forever in the history books. Evidence of this epic victory lies strewn about the Ardennes. The forest floor is littered with the corpses of more than 100,000 men of the Führer's Wehrmacht. In a fruitless attempt to split the Allies, seize Antwerp, and force a negotiated peace, Hitler has exhausted his troop reserves in the Stygian dark of this ancient wood. Their armies shattered, the Germans have been pushed back to the West Wall in just over a month. But the reversal has been hard won. Just six weeks ago, American soldiers talked happily under these trees of a white Christmas in the States. Now their frozen bodies are stacked like cordwood, waiting to be counted and sent to graves registration for burial. More than 81,000 sons of American mothers have paid the ultimate price to defend a piece of woods most had never even heard of, all because of one madman's desperate desire for self-preservation. My name is Jennifer Roman. I'm the superintendent of the Luxembourg American Cemetery and Memorial. I have the honor and pleasure um, overseeing these grounds where we have over 5,000 service members who gave their lives in service to their country during the Battle of the Bulge and the final Allied advance to the Rhine. Here at the Luxembourg American Cemetery, you can discover their stories, uh, pay homage to service members still missing in action on our walls of the missing and learn more about the service and sacrifice of the American armed forces that served during World War II. Amongst these 5,000 service members, uh, we have the graves of two Medal of Honor recipients, one Army nurse, and the grave site of General George S. Patton, Jr. Also of interest in the cemetery are five members of the famed Band of Brothers, depicted in the Band of Brothers series. Uh, 
There is more than that to discover, however. Um, if you would like to visit the Luxembourg American Cemetery, please know that we have staff on site every single day and we do provide free guided tours upon request.